in the movies and on TV, bad guys are usually depicted as clear-cut baddies, personally repellent and often cartoonishly evil. Unfortunately, history shows that real life is usually more subtle than that, and that folk who are objectively terrible, or even outright monstrous, are often quite charming in person. Which makes sense, especially for those in positions of power, without some ability to charm enough loyal followers, they are unlikely to gain power in the first place, or hang on to it once they have it. After all, the modern era's three worst monsters, Hitler, Stalin, and Mao, all managed to convince millions of adoring followers that they were good guys. Following are 16 people, actually or reputedly terrible, who were also capable of being quite charming. Number 1. Paul Pot was a kind and inspirational college professor. Salath Sar, better known to history as Paul Pot, 1925-1998, was a Cambodian communist revolutionary who led the Khmer Rouge into seizing power in 1975. The country, which was renamed Democratic Kampuchea, was then transformed into a nightmarish ideological tyranny, masterfully depicted in the 1984 movie, the killing field. During his years in power, roughly a quarter of Cambodia's population was killed in a horrific genocide carried out by Pol Pot and his followers, that was made even worse by its irrationality. In an attempt at social engineering, Cambodian cities were evacuated, and the urban masses were forcibly converted into peasants toiling on poorly run collective farms. Roughly 3 million were murdered or starved to death before the nightmare ended when the Khmer Rouge were driven from power in 1979. Monster though Paul Pot undoubtedly was, he was also a charismatic figure who gave little indication of what he would become. Born into a prosperous family, he received an elite education in Cambodia's best schools, before moving to Paris, France, where he joined the French Communist Party. Upon returning to Cambodia, he became a college professor, teaching French and geography, and was beloved by his students as a very kind man. In those days he frequently spoke on the themes of human decency and kindness, and was described as, an attractive figure. His deep voice and calm gestures were reassuring. He seemed to be someone who could explain things in such a way that you came to love justice and honesty and hate corruption, some students remembered him as calm, self-assured, smooth-featured, honest, and persuasive, even hypnotic when speaking to small groups. Many of those students became his most enthusiastic followers when he led the Khmer Rouge, and were among the most ruthless executioners of what came to be known as the Cambodian Genocide. Number 2. Captain Bly was an inspirational hero. In popular culture, Captain William Bly, 1754-1817, is the epitome of a tyrannical boss and cruel commanding officer. As portrayed in cinematic and fictional accounts of the mutiny on the bounty, Bly was an overbearing and despotic captain. He reportedly overworked, mistreated, and insulted his men, and was a sadist who gratuitously punished any who triggered his insecurities by flogging them to within an inch of their lives. In reality, when viewed within the context and norms of his era, Bly was a decent ship commander. He was no teddy bear, and frequently subjected his men to tongue lashings, but so did most captains back then. However, when it came to actual physical lashings, his men were flogged less frequently than were their peers sailing under other captains, Bly preferred to chastise his crew verbally, instead of physically. Also, unlike many captains of his day who neglected their crew's well-being, Bly invested significant time and effort in keeping his ship's company healthy. He organized their shifts to ensure that they got plenty of rest, oversaw a daily exercise regimen, and saw to it that they got as highly nutritious a diet as was possible under the circumstances. That his men eventually mutinied had little to with unbearable conditions or an impossible captain. The mutiny came about because, after an extremely long journey, the men had spent several weeks on leave in the tropical island paradise of Tahiti, partying it up with local women. When they finally sailed back home, the jarring contrast between the dreary ship life and the paradise they had left behind was too much, so they mutinied, ditched Bly, 
and returned to Tahiti. Bly's conduct after the mutiny was actually inspirational. After seizing the bounty he mutineers placed Bly and 17 other sailors loyal to him on a 23-foot boat, gave them provisions for five days, and cast them adrift. Seeing as how they were in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, thousands of miles from civilization, Bly and his followers were left to die. Instead, he demonstrated brilliant leadership under adversity. Bly kept his men alive and navigated the dinky boat nearly 4,000 until they reached civilization, all the while battling thirst, hunger, illness, and the occasional hostile natives. It was one of the most extraordinary feats of seamanship in history. Number 3. The Bad King from Braveheart Actually Wasn't That Bad Edward I, 1272-1307, is best known today as the short-tempered king from Braveheart, who invaded Scotland and wreaked havoc upon the locals for no discernible reason other than to slake his cruelty. In reality, he had been invited into Scotland by that kingdom's fractious nobles, who wanted him to arbitrate between rival claimants for the throne and choose their next king. He eventually decided to keep Scotland for himself, but few in those days would have done different in his shoes. While Edward could be pretty ruthless, even outright cruel at times, he was also capable of being likable and charming. Indeed, until Braveheart wrecked his image, Edward had a pretty good reputation as the most competent and influential king of the Plantagenet dynasty. His long list of accomplishments include reforming England's administration and laws, solidifying the common law, conquering Wales, and unifying Britain under his rule by exercising suzerainty over Scotland. Edward started doing great stuff while he was still a teenager, when he successfully crushed a rebellion against his hapless father, King Henry III, known as the Second Baron's War. He then went on a crusade that solidified his reputation as a capable military commander. While on crusade, he accomplished the rare feat of fighting off a killer of the assassin's cult, who tried to kill Edward in his sleep. After becoming king, he spent decades codifying the legal system and ensuring the uniform administration of laws. He was also determined to enforce his primacy over Britain, and started off with Wales, which he subdued and brought into the English legal and administrative framework. He also increased the role of Parliament, not out of any love for democracy, but because he saw Parliament as a useful vessel for raising taxes to fund his military campaigns. Number 4. King John of England was more sad than bad. King John of England 1166-1216 is best known as the bad guy from the Robin Hood legend, the cowardly usurper who kept trying to seize the throne while his heroic brother, King Richard the Lionheart, was doing God's work, fighting in the Crusades. While the reality was more complicated, and Richard was actually a bad king who detested England and the English, John was no saint, among other things. He personally murdered his teenage nephew, Arthur of Brittany, in a drunken rage. However, King John could also be quite a likable fellow when he wanted to be. The problem was that he often did not bother to even try. So his reign ended up being disastrous for England, he lost his French holdings, got the Pope to excommunicate him, and place England under an interdiction, and triggered a baronial rebellion that ended with the Magna Carta. However, all of that came about not because John was a cartoonishly evil king, but because he was an epically incompetent one. His brother Richard was captured and imprisoned on his way back from the Crusades, so John tried to usurp the throne, but bungled it and ended up banished and had his property confiscated. When he became king, he entered into a disastrous marriage that cost him much of his holdings in France, then got into a ruinous war with a French king that cost him the rest. At home he got into an argument with an archbishop, that ended up with the Pope excommunicating John and all of England. Even when he tried to do the right thing and shifted some of the burden of taxation from the peasants to the wealthy nobles, it backfired, leading to a baronial rebellion that forced him to sign the Magna Carta. Fittingly his final days were just as pathetic, while suffering a bout of dysentery that would ultimately do him in, he decided to take a shortcut through some marshy ground by a tidal estuary. The tide came and John barely escaped drowning, 
that ended up losing his baggage train and the crown jewels of England. Number 5. Alcibiades charmed and betrayed his way through classical Greece. Ancient Athenian aristocrat Alcibiades, 450-404 BC, was a brilliant politician and general who had no ethics, sense of loyalty, or a functioning moral compass. What he did have was natural charisma in abundance, which made people overlook and forgive his venality time after time. He was the most dynamic, fascinating, and catastrophic Athenian leader of the classical era. During the Peloponnesian War against Sparta, Alcibiades gained a reputation for courage and military talent, and was elected a general. In 415, he convinced Athens to send a massive expedition to invade Sicily. On the eve of sailing, however, statues of the god Hermes were desecrated, and suspicion fell upon Alcibiades, whose dissolute clique had a reputation for drunken vandalism and impiety. After the expedition sailed to Sicily, he was summoned to return to Athens and stand trial. Rather than obey the summons, he fled and defected to Sparta. He advised the Spartans to adopt the strategy that culminated in the annihilation of Athens' Sicilian expedition. Of the tens of thousands of Athenians who took part, few ever saw home again, those who were not massacred in the fighting were enslaved, then worked to death in Sicilian quarries. Alcibiades also convinced the Spartans to change their strategy of marching into Athenian territory each year to burn and loot, then repeat that the following year. Instead, he had the Spartans establish a permanent fortified base near Athens, which allowed them to exert direct pressure on that city year-round. He also went to Ionia, and stirred Athens' allies and subjects into revolting. Alcibiades thus helped bring Athens to the brink of collapse, but then wore out his welcome in Sparta after he was caught in bed with the wife of the Spartan king Agis II. Fleeing again this time to the Persians, Alcibiades convinced them to adopt a strategy that would prolong the war as long as possible, keeping the Athenians and Spartans too busy fighting each other to challenge Persia's interests. Then, incongruously, Alcibiades convinced the Athenian fleet to accept him as its commander. From 411 to 408 BC, he led the Athenian navy in a dramatic recovery, winning a series of stunning victories that turned the war around, and suddenly it was Sparta that was reeling, and on the verge of collapse. He returned to Athens in 407 BC, where he received a rapturous welcome, his earlier treasons forgiven and temporarily forgotten, and was given supreme command in conducting the war. However, Athens turned on Alcibiades a few months later, after a minor naval defeat when he was absent from the fleet. He fled again, and having burned bridges with all sides, holed up in a Thracian castle before taking refuge in Phrygia. There, a Spartan delegation convinced Phrygia's Persian governor to have Alcibiades murdered in 404 BC. Number 6. The Old Man of the Mountain Shikasan al-Sabah 1034-1124 was a charismatic but shady Islamic scholar who founded the Assassin's Cult, which terrorized the Middle East for a century and a half. He started in 1090 by seizing Alamout Castle in the mountains south of the Caspian Sea. His followers expanded from there to establish a series of remote mountain fortresses in the highlands of Persia and Syria, earning Sabah the nickname Old Man of the Mountain. He reportedly had so much charm that he convinced recruits that he held the keys to paradise, aided by innovative brainwashing techniques. Prospects would be summoned to an assassin fortress, housed in bare cells, and subjected to daily religious lectures, during which it would gradually be hinted that the sheik held the keys to paradise. Then, a promising recruit would be drugged with hashish, earning the group the Arabic name Hashashin, eventually rendered into assassins by Europeans. The recruit came to, high on hash, amidst beautifully landscaped gardens, with gurgling streams meandering between trees ripe with fruit, and vines heavy with grapes. Tame deer and lambs frolicked about, peacocks wandered around, ruffling and spreading their plumes, and birds of paradise flitted above, filling the air with their song. 
The stunning surroundings were complemented by stunningly beautiful women to seduce the recruit and satisfy all his desires. Plying the youth with wine and hash, and feeding him mouth-watering delicacies, the temptresses would convince the besotted recruit that he was in paradise, and that his seductresses were the hurries promised those who made it into heaven. Then, after days of delights and heavenly pleasures, the youth would be drugged senseless again, and removed from the gardens. He would awake back in his bare cell and inform that he had been in paradise, sent there by the grace of Sheikh Sabah, who held the keys to heaven. The recruit would then be told that he could return to paradise, provided he died while killing the Sheikh's enemies. It was highly effective, suicide squads of horny fanatics high on hash and desperate to die while killing the cult's enemies, descended from the assassin's mouth and hold fast to terrorize the Middle East. An early believer in propaganda of the deed, Sabah had his assassins murder their victims in as dramatic and public a manner, to advertise his cult's reach. It also struck fear into the hearts of leading men by fostering the perception that those targeted by the assassins were dead men walking, no matter the precautions taken. Sabah's cult survived him for nearly two centuries, until they were done in by the Mongols. Number 7. Black Bart, the Gentleman Bandit The Gentleman Bandit Black Bart, real name Charles Bowles, 1829 to circa 1888, was one of the Old West's most charismatic outlaws. He joined the California Gold Rush in 1849, and spent a few years prospecting before returning east and settling in Illinois. He enlisted in an Illinois regiment during the Civil War, became company first sergeant within a year, and was brevetted as a lieutenant before his discharge in 1865. He returned to prospecting for gold after the war, but had a run-in with Wells Fargo agents in 1871 that left him vowing vengeance. He got his revenge by changing his name to Black Bart, after a character from a dime novel, and taking up a career as a highwayman. He specialized in robbing Wells Fargo stagecoaches in Northern California and Southern Oregon. He had an air of sophistication and polite charm about him while robbing people at gunpoint, and was thus viewed as a gentleman bandit. His modus operandi was to rob on foot, wielding a double-barreled shotgun and clad in a linen duster and bowler hat, his face concealed by a flour sack with eye holes cut into it. Halting the stagecoach, he would cover the driver with his shotgun while politely ordering him to throw down the strongbox. He would then order the driver to move on, recover the strongbox, and vanish. He never fired his weapon, and sometimes left behind handwritten poems, which further enhanced his notoriety and gained him yet another the nickname, Black Bart the Poet. His career came to an end in 1883, when a robbery went bad and he was shot in the hand. Fleeing, he dropped some personal items, including a handkerchief with a laundry mark, that was eventually traced to a San Francisco laundromat and thence to Charles Bowles. Under interrogation, he confessed to robbing Wells Fargo stagecoaches, but only before 1879, on the mistaken assumption that the statute of limitations had run out on robberies committed before that year. Wells Fargo pressed charges only for the last robbery, and he was convicted and sentenced to six years, but was released early in 1888 for good behavior. In poor health, he did not return to his family, but wrote his wife that he was depressed and wanted to get away from everybody. He was last seen in a hotel in Visalia, California, from which he vanished a month after regaining his freedom. Number 8. The Butcher of Baghdad Pen Poetry and Maudlin Romances The Butcher of Baghdad to Saddam Hussein 1937-2006 ruled Iraq from 1979 until his ouster in 2003, a period marked by extreme brutality, repression, and corruption at home, plus costly wars against his neighbors. At least a quarter of a million Iraqis were killed in a variety of purges and genocides by Saddam's security services. Hundreds of thousands more Iraqis were killed in Saddam's invasions of Iran and Kuwait. He was also a smooth operator who knew how to lay on the charm when he wanted to. Indeed, on the day he was led to his execution, 
most of Saddam's American guards had tears in their eyes at the impending death of the kindly old man they had come to know. Utter yet, Saddam had a maudlin streak, writing four steamy romance novels, plus numerous poems and poetry collections. His best-known novel is Zabiba and the King, a convoluted love story set in 7th century Tikrit, Saddam's hometown. It revolves around the beautiful and brilliant Zabiba, her perverted husband, and a handsome ruler named Hussein. Each night, Zabiba is summoned to Hussein's palace, where she fobs off Hussein by giving long political speeches. Hussein eventually gets the hots for Zabibas, and sexual tension builds up between the duo. Her husband, fond of orgies and money and deviant sexual practices, is unhappy with the budding relationship between his wife and handsome Hussein. So Hubby disguises himself and rapes Zabiba as she walks home from the palace one night in order to shame her. However, Hussein loves Zabiba too much to let that destroy the romance, so he goes after the perpetrator. After various adventures, Zabiba leads an army and is mortally wounded in battle, dying while proclaiming Arab nationalism with her last breath. Hussein kills the rapist, avenging Zabiba's honor. The novel was as unsubtle an allegory as it gets. Zabiba represents the Iraqi people. The rapist husband represents America. The rape represents the United States ousting of Iraq from Kuwait in 1991, and is dated January 17, the same date as the commencement of Operation Desert Storm. The heroic King Hussein is Saddam Hussein. Knowing that they had better, Iraqi critics praised Zabiba as a literary masterpiece. It became a domestic bestseller, with over a million copies flying off the shelves, and a musical appeared in Iraqi theaters. Saddam's sycophants in the Iraqi Ministry of Information turned the novel into a 20-part television series, which aired on and was frequently rerun on Iraqi TV. Number 9. Israel Beer Charmed His Way Into the Highest Reaches of Israeli Government Israel Beer, 1912-1966, was a charismatic and well-liked Israeli officer who rose to prominence as an expert on Israeli military history. That expertise secured him a high-ranking position in the Israeli Ministry of Defense, which tasked him with writing a book on the Israeli War of Independence. It also won Beer a place as a trusted confidant and advisor of Israeli Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion. Beer arrived in Palestine in the late 1930s with an impressive CV. Having graduated from the Austrian Military Academy and served as an officer in the Austrian Army. He then fought in the Spanish Civil War with the International Brigade, where he was known by the nom de guerre Colonel José Gregorio. Between his martial exploits he managed to get a Ph.D. in literature from the University of Vienna. The resume was bunk, the real Israel Beer had died years earlier. His rapid rise highlighted the difficulty Israeli intelligence had during a period of mass immigration and spotting infiltrators. In reality, Beer was a Soviet spy, and not even a Jew. Supposedly a man of the sword and letters, urbane and handsome, he cut a swath through Israeli society and Tel Aviv's nightlife as a ladies' man. However, it took a long time before the fact that he was uncircumcised raised suspicions. In the meantime, Beer took advantage of his access to Israeli secrets and Israel's prime minister, whose diary he raided to not only photocopy, but to tear out entire pages and pass them on to his handlers. The deception finally fell apart in 1961, when he was caught delivering a briefcase stuffed with sensitive materials to the KGB. He never revealed his true identity during subsequent interrogations. He was tried and convicted of espionage, and sentenced to jail, where he died in 1966, taking the secret of his identity to his grave. Number 10. Jonathan Wilde was a crime fighter and criminal kingpin. 18th century English master criminal Jonathan Wilde, 1682 to 1725, reigned over an underground kingdom of thieves and highwaymen, ran a far flung extortion racket, and was Britain's biggest fence for stolen goods. After he feigned reform, the authorities turned to Wilde, gave him the title thief taker and set him loose on the criminals running amok and terrorizing London at the time. Wilde took to his new job and title with a passion, 
forming highly effective teams of thief catchers who fell upon the criminals with a will, breaking up gangs and sending criminals to the gallows by the dozen. During his thief catching career, at least 120 were executed based on Wilde's testimony and information that he furnished the authorities. As a side business, Wilde also had a gig as a private detective, recovering stolen goods for a fee. What he failed to tell his clients, however, was that their goods had been stolen by thieves working for Wilde, and that recovery simply came down to sifting through his warehouses of stolen property. Far from going legit, Wilde had hoodwinked everybody, and the thief catcher became an even bigger criminal kingpin, ridding himself of competitors by delivering them to the authorities. He was finally brought down when a criminal double-crossed by Wilde accused him of fencing stolen goods. An investigation confirmed the malfeasance, and Wilde was arrested. That was when many of his underlings turned Crown's evidence against him, and his whole scheme of simultaneously being England's greatest crime fighter and greatest criminal came out. He was swiftly tried, convicted, and hanged at Tyburn, where he had sent so many others to their doom.